Good afternoon. This is Ben Zong with the California Fiscal Partnership. Uh, I manage our online communications. Also with me today are my two colleagues, Keith Malone, who handles public affairs, and then David Park, who handles our industry affairs with the Fiscal Partnership. Uh, today's webinar is a general overview of the California Retail Hydrogen Station Network. And so if you have any technical questions or if you have any uh, specific questions about a particular station, or if you're part of media, uh, please contact us and we'll give you more detailed information on the side. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording as well as the presentation slides, they'll be posted next week. And so when they are posted, we will email all the registrants with a link to where that information is posted. Um, also during the webinar, everyone is muted. However, we will have a Q&A session at the end. And so please use the GoToWebinar tool to ask any questions. At the Fields of Partnership, we are a collaboration of industry and government organizations. And our main goal is to bring organizations together to work on expanding the market for hydrogen fuel technology and to help create a cleaner future. We currently have a little bit over 70 members. And so if, if your organization is interested in joining, uh, please contact us and we can discuss how we can work together to move hydrogen fuel technology forward. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Keith Malone to get us started, Keith. So we welcomed, welcomed since our last um, uh, online briefing, we've welcomed a few new members. Uh, just to remind you, like Ben said, our member, we are a public-private partnership. We bring together government at all levels, uh, private industry, universities, and others. And uh, these new members reflect that diversity. Um, we have welcomed Amoresco, a renewable energy company, uh, Fusion Fuel, which is focused on renewable hydrogen as a fuel. Um, a little more on the mobility side, we welcome Symbio, um, which is a, um, a product of a joint effort between Forestia and Michelin. Um, in addition, we also welcome Stratus Fuel. Um, they're a unique organization in that they are focused on uh, producing hydrogen, they're, um, they've also got the Stratashare program, a fleet of vehicles that can be uh, rented, uh, mostly in the Inland Empire area of Southern California. Um, and I will note that if you look at our private industry member mix, probably I'd say over 90% of them are international in scope. And we only have a few members that are what I might call local or regional, Stratus Fuel is one of them. Um, and hopefully we'll begin to see them in the future expand beyond their um, uh, local footprint. Uh, lastly, we welcome the University of California at Riverside, their Center for Environmental Research and Technology. They uh, join uh, uh, other universities that are part of the partnership, including uh, University of California at Berkeley, at Davis, at Irvine, as well as California State University. So um, like Ben said, uh, we're a growing organization uh, reflecting the greater interest and the acceleration in hydrogen, and we're glad to have them all. So Ben, I'll hand that back to you. Oh, and it's, it's my turn again. We have some upcoming events we wanted to kind of uh, have you focus on. Uh, coming up at the end of this month, is RE Plus in Anaheim, California. RE Plus, you may remember as Solar Power International or SPI. Um, increasingly over the last 10 years or more, they've been bringing not just solar into the mix of their conference, but wind power, microgrids, batteries, and over the last several years, hydrogen. And we've been very proud to partner with them. This year, co-locating with their conference, is the Zero Emission Bus Conference, which is organized by the Center for Transportation and the Environment, focused on both battery electric and fuel cell electric buses. I know they're gonna have at least, I think, 10 buses that are on display in the common area of the Anaheim Convention Center. And then lastly, but not least, is the Center for Hydrogen Safety and their Americas Conference. Uh, so this really offers opportunities for folks um, 
you know, a lot of times increasingly with hydrogen, many of you have probably noticed, there are a lot of conferences that are not just uh, hydrogen focused, but increasingly focusing on hydrogen. And it's great to see these opportunities where you can go to one place and, and take part in these multiple opportunities. So let's move on to the next slide. Ben? Thanks, Keith. And so uh, I'd like to share with you all a, a couple of resources that we have available through the Fields of Partnership. Um, the first resource is our station map. And so this is a map that we use to uh, track stations that are currently open in California, as well as those stations that are in development. We track stations that, uh, for an in development, we track the different phases that are, they are in. So whether they're in, a, in construction, in permitting, and you can filter those using the filter system here. By default, we only show light duty stations, meaning stations that can be accessed by the Mirai, the Nexo, and the Clarity. Um, but we do also have the heavy duty stations that are tracked on this map. And so if you wanna see those stations, uh, again, you can use this filter system and that will show the, uh, the heavy duty stations. For the stations that are open, we are now also showing the current status of the station. So if you click on it, it will show um, the, the current status at that station in real time. And then also uh, with the map view, again, you'll see that the different statuses pop up for the open retail station. You can also see this, the, all these stations in a list view by clicking on the download station list. And this will again, give you a PDF with a list uh, in alphabetical order of all the stations that are open and in development in California. Our next resource is our resources page. So this can be found on our website at cfsp.org and then clicking on either the resources tab, main tab, or in resources here. Uh, this is a repository of, of uh, reports, uh, research um, that we have both internally as well as externally. It's a great resource that we use both internally with, with staff as well as you know, our members use it. And I, I believe you will find it useful as well for anything hydrogen and fuel separated. Um, and again, you can also filter these clicking on any of the uh, uh, filters at the top. Ben, I'll also add, when Ben said we we use it, we use it. Um, this is a resource that, that, that helps us find key documents. And I will tell you, anytime we find a good document, um, we put it in here. So if you have documents you'd like to have us add, let us know, send us an email, and and we hope we can include it. Thanks, Keith. Our next resource is our By the Numbers. So this is a snapshot of where we are with vehicle sales in the US, as well as uh, infrastructure in California. I won't talk about the, uh, the, the details. David Park's gonna mention a little more about, about that in a minute here, but uh, we do update this on a monthly basis. And so uh, we'll, we will, we're expecting to get the August numbers fairly soon here, and so we'll be making those updates to this page. Ben, I, I wanted to add one more thing because you showed the map of stations and I want to uh, let people know, a lot of times people try and use that map to count the number of stations. You'll notice on this by the numbers page that we have one line where we show about 70 stations for which a location has not been identified. So missing from that map are potentially 70 locations, but until we know where they're going to be located, we cannot add them. So just be careful for those of you that are using this page for doing your kind of calculating the number of stations that we're gonna see here in California now and through the next several years. Just bear that in mind. Thanks, Keith. And our next resource is our events page. This page lists primarily events that the partnership uh, staff attends, but also any other events that pertains to the industry. And so if, again, if you have an event that you think uh, would be of interest to our audience, you can use the submit an event and we will consider adding it to our list here. Next is our news page. So this is news in the media that's curated by Keith Malone. And uh, again, we have a filter that allows you to filter it by the different subjects. Um, and again, if you have any, any news that, um, that we've missed and you think is important uh, and is relevant to, to this industry, let us know and we can add it to this list. And then last, uh, the last resource that I want you to be aware of is our station operational status system, or better known as SAS. This is um, 
a tool that you can use to see in real time what the current operational status is at any given station. Um, we have five essential stations or five different statuses for each station. Uh, online essentially means that the stations that you can get a full fill. A yellow triangle means that you're, you're going to get hydrogen, but you're not going to get a full fill. A red square means that it's currently offline and not dispensing hydrogen. Stations typically go offline for a number of reasons. Uh, typically, uh, we, we're, we're seeing stations go offline due to mechanical issues. So that could be a compressor failure, um, a chiller failure. We're also seeing stations go offline due to point of sale failures. Um, there's other reasons that can also cause station to be unavailable. So for instance, if the station is being um, going under construction and it's blocking the, the hydrogen dispenser, then the station developer also put that site into an, an offline state. And then uh, the other reason we're seeing stations go offline is, is hydrogen supply. We haven't really been seeing supply issues as much recently, but uh, if there is a, a supply issue for that particular station, a station developer will come in and add a note and usually will let you know when they're expecting to get their next delivery. I'll talk more and show more detail on, on what that note looks like. Then the other two sta statuses that we have are refresh and unknown. Refresh essentially means that the high buffer storage is out of hydrogen at the time and usually takes about 10 minutes for you to, um, to go to that station to rebuffer before you can get hydrogen. And then the last status is unknown. And so that means that we've lost data connectivity with the site. So that's typically caused with electric failure or the, the computer going offline. And so if you do see a, an unknown status, uh, click on the station and there is a customer service number. Uh, call the customer service number and ask them what the status is. Uh, it, it, again, if we don't get any data within 30 minutes, we usually switch it to an unknown state. And then this, uh, this yellow box is the information that I was referring to earlier. Um, so again, if, if there's going to be an outage, usually station developers will let you know when that outage is going to take place, if they know it, and then also if they know it, they'll let you know when that, that station is expected to come back online. So this is what uh, David was talking about earlier. In the Sacramento area, we're expecting to see some high heat for the next, uh, for the next week, and so they've alerted customers using this, this system here. Through SOS, you can also sign up for an account. And so uh, I'm, I'm logged into my account already, but if, if you're not logged in, there's a sign up uh, button at the top right. By signing up, you can sort the stations based on what you prefer. Um, so by default, they're sorted in alphabetical order. Um, but again, if you're in Sacramento, you, you probably want the Sacramento stations at the top. You can also sign up for notifications. And so with this, you'll get real-time notifications when a station changes status from online to offline or to limited. Um, I recommend at least signing up for emails, but uh, text messages can sometimes be a bit overwhelming. And so if it does become overwhelming, you can come back to the system here and then just disable just the text messages or any of the other statuses that you're not uh, 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 wanting to, to see. So at the top, if there's any major um, outages or if there's any network-wide um, information, we will typically add a note at the top of SAS here. With a, it's usually with a, um, I believe it's in the yellow background, and it will give a date with the note. Um, and so that note, um, we haven't seen anything major currently. Um, there was a, a hydrogen price increase that we had anticipated to add a note, uh, but um, didn't, but didn't add. But uh, something like that is something that we would add, for instance, at the top of this page here. The data again is coming directly from the stations themselves. Most of the data is coming in in real time, um, and so we encourage you to use this if you're driving a fiscal vehicle. We also provide this data to third-party apps. So we have, for instance, the Toyota Intune app, the Honda Link app, Hyundai's uh, got their My Hyundai app, uh, True Zero's also got a Station Finder app, and then there's the Hygo app. Those are just a few of the station of the apps that are out there. Um, I encourage you to use whichever app is you're most comfortable with, but again, all the data comes into from the stations directly to SAS, and then we transmit that to those stations, or those apps there. And so with that, I'm going to pass it back to, well, I'm going to give it to David Park, who's going to talk a little more about uh, the network and where we're at. Hey. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so as Ben mentioned, uh, these values on the slide of treat being presented were pulled from our By the Numbers page. Um, at the end of the presentation, you'll see the URL once again. But as you can see, the fuel cell vehicle population in the U.S. 
Um, predominantly, those are vehicles in California. Since California has the predominant fueling, hydrogen fueling network in the U.S., uh, we are just over 14,000 vehicles uh, by the end of July. Um, we did see a, although the population has grown, we did see a slowdown in the last quarter. Uh, this has been due in part to the availability of vehicles, and uh, that's a trickle effect that's affected the entire retail automotive market due to manu manufacturing parts supply chain challenges. Um, the uh, number of stations you might see, it, that number, right now we have 54 stations available. That's, that value fluctuates up and down as new stations come online, and then uh, some of the stations in our existing network have to drop off temporarily um, for various reasons, which I'll discuss in a subsequent slide. Uh, as Keith mentioned, we have a total of 117 stations that are funded. These are light duty fueling stations, um, of which 47 stations are currently in the developmental pipeline and uh, 70 locations um, have been funded, but uh, the developers that have been awarded the funding have not yet identified where those stations will, uh, will go. Um, we do see the truck station network. Uh, we, we currently have three truck stations available. Those are all in the Los Angeles Air Basin. Uh, two are at the ports of LA and Long Beach. And then one station is uh, bookends the drage routes um, in Ontario. And uh, right now we also have nine truck stations in some stage of development throughout California. Next slide, please. So um, our our partner organization, GoBiz, one of our one of our member organizations, um, we work with them uh, to coordinate the tracking of station development. Uh, this chart shows the historical uh, the historical perspective on station development since 2015. As you can see, in 2021, um, there was a uptick in station development that was due to the uh, California Energy Commission award of $115 million to, uh, to develop retail uh, life duty fueling stations. Um, we see those projects that were in the pipeline, they are now starting to go into the commissioning phase. And so we're seeing an uptick in in uh, retail hydrogen station uh, stations coming online, and uh, we're seeing the commissioning and the development uh, continue to increase in pace. Next slide, please. Um, digging into the details of the fueling network, uh, we see that California's retail fueling network continues to evolve. evolve. We are seeing the network average availability trend upwards. Um, and since the last webinar, five new stations have opened. Those are in Burbank, Cupertino, two stations in San, o San Jose, and then one additional station in Burbank, bringing the year's total to 12 new, sta 12 new stations. Um, that's some sort of record, I'm sure. Uh, because we've not yet we're, we're in september and uh we know that there are several stations still in the commissioning pipeline um we do acknowledge that there are still challenges with the station network we saw a disruption in sacramento um there are three stations in the sacramento region and um you know when one station is not available that puts additional pressure on the other two stations um, which can cause slowdowns, for instance, in the recharge of those high pressure storage banks. Um, this upcoming heat event uh, will likely also cause a slowdown in um, in the recharging of stations. So we'll, we do ask that drivers um, pause and give the station a few minutes to recharge those high pressure storage banks uh, after the previous driver completes their fill. Um, it, but in general, we are seeing that station short fills and durabil durability have vastly improved. Um, the station developers have improved their their ability to respond to mechanical failures at stations. And then we are seeing 
generally seeing the supply chain of hydrogen and station parts continue to improve. Um, what, one additional point that we'd like to uh, like to point out is that you may have noticed the price of hydrogen has trended upwards um, in the last few months at several stations, and this is due to the inflationary pressure. Uh, next slide, please. Getting to uh, the hydrogen production supply chain, one of the really exciting pieces of news that, that came to light uh, just this past May is in Las Vegas, Air Liquide opened its largest liquid hydrogen production facility, uh, which is also its largest facility in the U.S. Uh, the plant will produce 30 tons of liquid hydrogen per, per day uh, using renewable feedstock. Uh, the plant is a $250 million investment by Air Liquide into the hydrogen marketplace. Um, the hydrogen produced at this plant is predominantly uh, is produced predominantly for the California marketplace, and the facility can provide enough renewable hydrogen to fuel about 40,000 fuel cell electric vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. And then continuing to look at California state investment into hydrogen, uh, the California Energy Commission announced $185 million in funding award grant awards into the zero emission transportation manufacturing sector. Uh, highlighted on this slide are some of the hydrogen investments made by the state. We saw First Element Fuel, a hydrogen station developer, receive $9.2 million to develop additional fueling stations. Symbio One North America received an award of $9.1 million to, for a hydrogen fuel cell manufacturing and training facility. We saw Wiggins Lift Company, a forklift manufacturer, receive $8.1 million for uh, the production of electrified forklift technology. Um, and then we saw a slew of uh, battery production and battery electric vehicle related uh, grants. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, one piece of news that you, uh, I'm sure you've heard, and if you haven't, uh, what, where you've been, but uh, the California Air Resources Board unanimously adopted the advanced clean crime regulation. Uh, this is a landmark regulation. We heard the news story picked up across the U.S. and, in fact, pretty globally um, because it's uh, first of its kind in the United States, but it's a requirement to uh, for light duty, uh, for new light duty sales to be zero emission vehicles uh, by 2035. There is, there is a phasing approach starting with 35% of vehicle sales in 2024 ramping up to 100% of vehicle sales in 2035. Uh, we do note that there is allowance for plug-in electric vehicles for difficult to electrify classifications of vehicles. But uh, perhaps the big part of the story is that there are other states, specifically those that have adopted Section 177 of the Clean Air Act, which is uh, referred to as the 177 states, but those states have indicated that they intend to also adopt this hard new sales requirement. And um, I see my colleague Keith has, has appeared, but Keith, what, what percentage of the market do you think that was 177 California represent? Trick question. <laughs> you know, the U.S. automotive market. So um, if the one seven states adopt this regulation in lockstep with California, we're looking at almost half of all new uh, automotive sales in the U.S. by 2035 being zero emission vehicles. So, uh, Keith, I think you wanted to add some more detail to this. Uh, just some other elements we put on this slide to kind of let you know kind of how this is all related into other policies and other analyses that are coming out of CARB and Dave weigh in on this, because I'm, I'm sure I'm missing something. But if you look at their 2020 mobile source strategy, to the right of it, you can see these projections about what 
how they think the Electra, uh, the EV market, the ZEV market is going to go over the years, but also below that figure 15, kind of looking at um, the light duty uh, uh, zero emission vehicle market. And their analysis shows that it's very likely that fuel cell, light duty fuel cell cars will be about 25% of the light duty market. I know we hear a lot about certain vehicle categories and there are kind of generalities that are made. And it's important to remember that while a technology may excel in a particular vehicle category, in many cases, it's not to the exclusion of the other. That's the nicest way I can put it or most or more thoughtfully. And then down to the left, you know, kind of buttressing that, are the analyses out of car uh, that we can get to a self-sufficient light duty fueling network for hydrogen by 2030. And this analysis looks at a thousand stations. So, you know, a lot of um, an additional work is going on in the background by a variety of stakeholders, but in order for just fuel cell vehicles alone to meet this goal by, 2045 of a 25% of the market, we're going to be needing to build a lot of stations between now and then. I've heard estimates ranging between 90 to 130 stations being built per year in order to meet that goal. So just to give you a sense of the magnitude and the step change that is required for us to get to that zero emission, zero emission future. Any thoughts, Dave? Anything I've missed? No, like that, that, that covers it. I would say that um, the self-sufficiency report indicates that um, something on the order of an additional $300 million infused into the hydrogen uh, retail network, um, at a maximum $300 million that it would light off the self-sufficient market where it attracts private investment to come in and, and uh, backfill and start funding the development of these additional stations. And, and then to even add on to that, that 300 million only represents 10% of the cost, meaning 2.7 billion is expected to be borne by private industry. That's, you know, when people hear 300 million, you have to remember in the context of the California state budget, it's a drop in the bucket. But when you also kind of pull out and look at the contributions of government versus private industry, just in the last, what, seven to eight years for light duty hydrogen fueling in California, the, the, the percentage of private industry contribution is going up. So, oh, yeah. so a lot of good indicators for us. Absolutely. So Ben, uh, next slide. So um, if this slide looks like it's packed with a lot of information, it is. Um, and it's no surprise, uh, a lot is going on right now um, uh, in the light duty market. In fact, actually a lot is going on everywhere with hydrogen. Um, but a couple of things we've seen, and I've included here light and medium duty, partly because these vehicle categories are gonna be using that vehicle network we were just talking about. You know, until we get to a point where you start to see fleets and their fueling goes private, they're going to be using this network for quite some time. So most of you have been hearing off and on about BMW coming to market. You'll look in the lower right-hand corner. This is a news release that just came out of BMW yesterday. It's really nice. It's one thing to see it quoted by news media or in the blogs, but when the company comes out and makes a statement, it's really good news. And if you kind of read it thoroughly, I, I recommend reading it. Um, they're taking kind of a a crawl, walk, run approach over the next three years, the end of this year, starting out with a small number of vehicles and then building to an official launch in 2025. And then also kind of other, and then in the very middle of the slide, Hyundai as well, because I want to deal with Hyundai, they're talking about their next version of the Nexo, which is really good news. Um, we're starting to see companies like Hopium out of France, uh, they just revealed the interior of their vehicle, another key step on their way to production. Um, and to the lower left of that, River Simple. And both of these companies have been visiting California over the last year. And in fact, River Simple is looking 
to locate here, not, not shift their headquarters, but establish a foothold here in the US. Obviously, California uh, makes for a really good sort of beachhead for them. Um, and then to the lower left, you're seeing that um, Porsche, uh, just in the last, I believe, week or two, is talking about um, potentially, or at least they're seeing the value of, of hydrogen, but in this particular case, it's internal combustion engine uh, technology. They're not the only one that we've seen out there in the news, as I'm sure you've also seen. We've also seen Toyota talk about it. We've seen Cummins as well. I will note that it appears under the current ZEV regulations that internal combustion engine technology with hydrogen will not qualify under the new um, uh, mandate. And, and I want to hand it over to Dave for the next element of this page. Yeah, I think, thank you, Keith. The, uh, we're seeing the manufacturers, they're, they're exploring all options in terms of trying to achieve a zero carbon footprint in their, in their vehicle fleets. But um, probably one of the most exciting developments that we, saw, that we saw come out in the news very recently is a Ford SoCal Gas, Southern California Gas Company partnership to demonstrate uh, integrating a fuel cell into Ford's F-550 truck. Um, that particular truck line is exciting because it's the uh, utility class trucks that are that is used by many public utilities around the country. And the feedback that we've gotten is that uh, they're anxious about electrification of that drive line. Um, in part because of the, the duty cycle that that vehicle has to undergo. And it's not just driving the vehicle, but also the use of the power takeoff or PTO um, to, to power auxiliary equipment, such as pumps that might pump you know, water, and so it might be under heavy load for long durations of time. Um, the feedback from the utilities is that they, their concern would be if they have to field deploy these vehicles, these electrified vehicles, they want to make sure that they have sufficient power to run those equipment, but then also get the vehicle back to base. And so um, the use of hydrogen in that class is, is exciting in that hydrogen does offer, you know, the opportunity to store, um, store energy in a way that potentially batteries cannot. Um, Collaboration is part of the US DOE's um, Super Truck 3 program, and we've been told to look out for more announcements out of that program for more exciting you know, fuel cell electric vehicle developments. Thanks, Keith. So, Ben, let's go to the next slide. Um, so, heavy duty trucks. Um, you'll notice for the first time in many of the last uh, webinars, I've included a lot of photos of the various manufacturers that are in play, automakers or OEMs of, of heavy duty vehicles that are in play. Um, but this time, uh, I wanted to focus a little bit more about some other elements. So, to the left, Travel Centers of America about two weeks ago came out with a white paper about. Uh, their survey of fleets and what their needs are. And it came back really clear. It's no surprise to anyone. Fleets want to see the infrastructure before they really make that investment in the vehicles. We're seeing a lot of them testing vehicles in their fleets. Um, but, but no surprise to anyone what we've seen in the light duty network. They not just want to see stations that are open and operating, but they want to see that longer term commitment. Again, sending market signals, working together in a way that government and private industry can really show, you know, um, uh, fleet operators, this is a good investment. Um, over to the right, some other, um, you know, kind of interesting events over the last couple of weeks. Bosch is entering the U.S. market um, to supply parts for truck, heavy duty trucks, including one of their um, partners, Nikola Motor. Uh, Kenworth there in the center um, showing very strong interest in fuel cell technology. Obviously, they're already working with Toyota. They got trucks that are operating out of the LA and Long Beach ports. Um, as the stations, remember we showed you the number of stations that are open 
and those station locations that have been announced. Nikola recently announced three station locations that they're building for their uh, the fleets they'll be they'll be uh, uh, leasing. And then uh, smack dab in the middle there is a um, kind of a snippet from the map we had in our truck vision document that we released last year. And a lot has happened between the release of that vision document and where we are today. And we are right now, as you can see, uh, just below that map, uh, the words National Hydrogen Mobility Strategy. And we are in the very earliest stages of talking with stakeholders here and across the country. Um, as many of you know, the partnership will soon become a national nonprofit. Um, this national hydrogen mobility strategy is not just a reflection of our expansion, but of, of the need, really um, the need to scale quickly, the need to reach beyond the California borders, but also with trucking in a way that the other kinds of vehicle categories, trucks, uh, the, in a way that buses and cars maybe don't, but trucks cross state boundaries always. It's a given. And while we initially focused on the West Coast, I think that's possible with the five from the border with Baja up to British Columbia. Um, we really need to focus on a national plan. That's really how this is going to work. So uh, we're beginning the conversation with a variety of stakeholders, not only in um, not just organizations, but other states, other regions, fleet operators, and others, as we socialize some of the key ideas for this. And really doing the work that we've always done, which is bringing together government, private industry, and others in a national discussion of how do we roll out trucks, how do we connect uh, hydrogen hubs and ports, and how this national network may serve as the beginnings of a network for light duty vehicles. Um, ben, let's go to the next slide on buses. Uh, this is a really boring slide and it shouldn't be. I'm a big believer. I think you've probably heard me say before, buses are, buses, battery electric and fuel cell electric are the canaries in the coal mine. They are really ahead of everyone else, really showing where the opportunities, the benefits and the challenges are for both pathways. Um, here in California, and I, and, and I know I'm just California focused at the moment, but I can assure you it's not just California pursuing fuel cell buses, but you know, Humboldt Transit, they're in the very, for those of you not familiar with California, Humboldt is up in the very northwest corner of California along what we call the Redwood Coast, a beautiful uh, coastal area of California, um, relatively isolated. Um, but they are pursuing fuel cell uh, electric buses for the needs that they have given the vis distances, given some of the extreme temperature issues they experience, especially with cold. Um, uh, also, I've in the last at least two um, uh, quarterly webinars, I've mentioned AC Transit and their ongoing zero emission bus uh, study, which we uh, um, commonly call the five by five study. And they released their volume three. I can't emphasize how important this study is. I don't, from what I've seen, no one is doing anything like this and it will have implications, not only for fleets here in the US and North America, but I think across the globe as well. To remind you, they are comparing their buses, new fuel cell, old or legacy fuel cell versus battery electric versus, uh, diesel versus hybrid diesel. Amazing study, they're working with Stanford. It's really worth a look. Down at the bottom of the page, I've included the current fuel cell bus census for California. If you think it's off and the numbers are a little bit wrong, I'm not surprised. There's a lot going on trying to track. It can be really difficult. And we started doing a national bus census and I hope to share that soon. But just know for the most part at the moment, the bulk of the buses here, both the bulk of the buses on the road are here in California, the other being SARTA um, uh, out in Ohio, 
but there are a lot of agencies where you have buses that are in development in the purchase pipeline in other states, and it's really great to see that. So let's go to the next slide, Ben. So um, most of you are, I think everyone's trying to keep track of what's going on with hydrogen hubs. Uh, I suspect some of you online are probably doing it better than we are. Um, but most of us, I have to be honest, a lot of people are like, what's happening? And it's, um, it's a little hard to track at the moment. Remember, uh, DOE has a series of deadlines. One, the first one really coming up, probably we suspect in October, um, but we're now beginning to see the states not just come together, but begin um, incorporating nonprofit organizations these kind of public-private partnerships that will manage the applications and ultimately, ideally, um, the implementation of these hubs. Some of you may recall DOE is doing a sequenced approach, um, you know, not all at once, submit the idea, then come back, um, uh, submit something more substantial. Um, it's going to be, I think there's a recognition of we need to get this right. And as you can see at the very top, California has organized its nonprofit, the uh, Arches, the Alliance Renewable Alliance for Renewable Clean Hydrogen Energy Systems. And if you look at their self description, they talk about California and beyond. So um, this is my editorial comment. Adding in Nevada and Arizona, I wouldn't be surprised for any number of reasons. Remember the Air Liquide plant, Las Vegas. There are opportunities in those states. Every state has kind of their strength. Um, we now finally see New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. They've established their group, WISH. Um, New York, just uh, the New York or Northeast cluster just added Maine and Rhode Island. Um, and uh, we're now beginning to see, um, and, and I apologize for adding in at the last minute, uh, the Midwest group um uh just trying to keep up with everything that's happening and i know i've forgotten groups and i'm quite sure one or two of you will be emailing me shortly with additional information and then lastly at the bottom we have the pacific northwest hydrogen association which at the moment is primarily washington it's pretty clear i think that oregon will join them um it would surprise me if you start to see other states and um you know i'll talk a little bit more about the global reaction to not just um, the infrastructure law that funded the hydrogen hub effort, but Dave's going to talk about IRA, but then it's interesting, we're going to talk about the international reaction, or at least the preliminary reaction to what's happening here in the U.S. So Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Keith. It's uh, just really exciting news stories coming out almost daily, but um, Again, another newsworthy item that I'm sure all of you have heard of is the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. It was passed by Congress and signed into law on August 16th, and it includes a number of provisions uh, that are projected to result in significant investments in domestic energy production and manufacturing uh, with the goal of reducing carbon emissions by roughly 40% by 2030. Uh, the law represents the largest investment into climate change in U.S. history. Uh, focusing on the clean hydrogen production incentives, um, it's the program is it provides several tax credit provisions to incentivize the development of hydrogen production and storage facilities. Um, there's a lot of language on the slide. I'll let you take your time and read through it. But uh, in summary, the base tax credit is. 60 cents per kilogram of clean hydrogen produced where life cycle where and uh, there are life cycle carbon intensity requirements. It must not exceed four kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen produced. Um, the tax credit is adjusted downward as carbon as the uh, carbon intensity increases from about, well, from 0.45 kilograms to four kilograms uh, of hydrogen produced. And, you know, with that maximum of four kilograms CO2. 
Um, the tax credit can also be adjusted upwards and upwards up to five times if prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements are satisfied. And then uh, one of the uh, really exciting components of the Inflation Reduction Act is um, it puts hydrogen on par with other energy storage technologies on the electrical side, um, where hydrogen is put on equal footing to battery and thermal electric storage. Um, there's a lot more to dig into. Um, you know, as I noted on the slide, this is a $737 billion investment into energy production and manufacturing and also healthcare. You know, clearly we are focused on the energy side and then more specifically hydrogen. But then on the vehicle side, um, there is a, you know, $1 billion rebate uh, grant program included in the, in the law. Um, zero emission port equipment and climate action plans, uh, $3 billion, $3 billion that are put into, into that area. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service is receiving $1.3 billion for conversion of the fleet to zero emission vehicles and $1.7 billion for zero emission vehicle infrastructure. And then we saw a automotive uh, zero emission vehicle tax credit increase uh, there is uh, $7,500 put towards new zero emission vehicle purchases, but then a new $4,000 used zero emission vehicle purchase uh, tax credit. Uh, we also see a commercial zero emission vehicle tax credit, which is up to 15% of the cost um, with a per vehicle limit of $7,500 for vehicles that are less than 14,000 pounds and then up to $40,000 for larger vehicles. So again, um, really exciting developments in the Inflation Reduction Act. I'll turn it back to uh, Keith to go into the global perspective. And this all leads up to, and, and, and just so you know, there is so much going on globally. I think we all know that. Um, I'm just focusing on really hydrogen production. Um, I don't know, most of you probably saw Germany and Canada signing that significant agreement um, in the last week. Um, Germany, Canada is not the only place. Germany's been kind of shopping around, as I recall, Chile, Australia. Um, and I think we still really haven't heard um, efforts out of Europe going into North Africa and the Middle East. Um, I think those will also be significant efforts when they happen. Um, as most of you may recall, uh, the Germans have said, we may not make all of our own hydrogen, but we will own the technology. And um, as I've said in a lot of the past uh, briefings that Europe has become uh, very aggressive in its, uh, um, in its language about renewable hydrogen and showing leadership, um, the recent IRA has made a few pause and reflect. Um, on the left there, uh, Yorgo Chatsimarkakis, the CEO of Hydrogen Europe, basically came out after the IRA about a week after about a week ago and said, you know, kind of the US is now on our tail and they have some elements that put them ahead of us. So, you know, we've been talking about the game is on, but um it's on and it's not just um, a kind of these bilateral sorts of competition. Um, it's multilateral, it's global. It's going to be absolutely fascinating over the next 10 to 20 years um, as we move forward. Um, you can see on the right, uh, uh, IHS market, which is now part of S&P Global, uh, uh, looking at current electrolyzer manufacturing capacity and thinking it could quadruple by 2025. We've seen a lot of announcements already out of electrolyzer companies talking about scaling up their production. Um, so it's no surprise. Uh, down below, you may have seen Amazon um, further cemented their relationship with plug power uh, when it comes to green hyd renewable hydrogen. We like, to, we like to stay away from the colors of hydrogen and really focus on kind of more the carbon intensity. But that said, I'm including Ama, um, Plug Power and Amazon here because they are global companies. 
Plug Power, I, as I recall, announced a major agreement, I believe with the Port of Amsterdam, forgive me if I'm a little bit off, but um, they're active in Europe as well. Um, but all in all, this really signals the US has awakened when it comes to hydrogen. Um, we expect this to have, I think, a significant effect on hydrogen mobility, especially because we can become an early um, user of a lot of the hydrogen produced out of these hub efforts. Um, and again, that's my personal opinion, not the partnerships. Um, but that said, um, I think is kind of a fitting way to get to the, I believe it, this is the end of our presentation portion. Let's go to the next slide. We've tried to list a lot of key resources that we've mentioned both on our website, um, ones that we've mentioned in the slides. If you don't see something that we mentioned, email us. We'll be happy to work with you and find it. As always, that resources database can be a very nice resource in finding a lot of the things that we have already mentioned. Um, so Ben, I want to hand this uh, back to you so we can go into the Q&A portion. Thanks, Keith. And so first off, I, th there are way more questions that we're gonna then we're gonna have time to to answer and so we do apologize if we don't get to yours uh but uh, we will try to respond to you directly if we're not able to um through this webinar here um so i'm gonna tackle a couple of questions um and and um all of the questions around the station map and sauce uh, first off for, for the station map there's questions about how uh, we how people can add their stations onto the station map. And so if you're a station developer and, and um, you'd like to get your station onto a station map right now, majority of the stations that are on the map are stations that are funded through the California Energy Commission. And so we are looking at a protocol to add privately funded stations or stations that are not specifically funded through the, the CEC. And so again, if you have a station, uh, contact me. Um, my, my contact is on the screen here, as well as Dave Park, and we will put that uh, listed onto, onto our station map. The second piece is around the station operational status system, or SAS. Uh, there's, there's feedback on, on how to improve it, and uh, we are looking to, to make some major improvements to SAS, including developing an, an iOS app as well as an Android app. And so we are taking feedback um, on how on ways we can improve that system ways we can allow you as customers to be able to, to uh, interact with each other. And so any of that information, again, please send that over to myself or to David Park, and we will look into doing that uh, once we begin that development. Um, and again, because we do have a wide array of, of audiences here, we're gonna try to, I'm gonna try to summarize some of these questions and, and keep it kind of high level. Uh, the first question that came in um, is around the San Diego area. And I think Dave, you, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but there's questions about, you know, why is the San Diego station offline so much and when will it be more more reliable? When, when will there be more stations around that area? Sure. Um, San Diego, although it's been identified as one of the major markets uh, for the automakers to introduce vehicles, um, development in that geographic area has been slow. Um, if you look at the priority location, the automakers are that they'd like to see at least five additional stations uh, built in the San Diego area. Uh, currently, we have um, one in downtown San Diego at Mission Center Drive. Um, it's actually very exciting news because um, we are we see that that station has moved out of the construction phase into the commissioning stage, and therefore. It's um it, it's in the pipeline to be um to be commissioned and then brought online. Um, in terms of why is the station down, it is unfortunately um I think it's the Del Mar station. I, I forget specifically, but um that station is um one of the few in San Diego, if not the only one, and and uh, therefore it is um it. it receives a high volume of vehicles and so um, the station sees a lot of throughput it's wear and tear on the equipment um, and then also if you're in a line of cars um, it does take you know after about three fills um, it takes a little longer for that high pressure storage bank to recharge 
David, touching on on where the stations are are going to be um, built next, there there were a number of questions around where stations are going to fill in. Are new stations going to fill in existing areas or focus on the expanding network? Uh, can you touch on that? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. And um, thanks, Ben, for putting this um, this letter or this solicitation up on the screen. But uh, the automotive manufacturers, we we um, assemble them and then they provide their preferred market locations to open up. Um, right now, they do recognize that there is a need for stations in the core markets in California, which are right now predominantly San Francisco and then the Los Angeles, Orange County areas. Um, and they do see that there is a need for infill still, a considerable need for infill in those stations. Um, as you saw on our by the numbers page, there are 70 uh, stations that have been funded, but locations have not yet been identified. Um, the listing that Ben is displaying right now, and this is um, the letter, if you Google 2019 OEM priority market locations, um, you'll find this letter, but this letter identifies the location um, that the automakers feel need to be developed. And it, it can get very granular down to, you know, specific intersections of interstate and, and state highway. Um, but uh, that said, then there is also clearly a need for a connector, what we call connector and destination stations. So we have those core urban market locations, but then we have the stations that connect the urban markets and then uh, the stations that open up new markets. So um, there is this balance, you know, the, the market has been established in the urban areas. Um, the, uh, if you look at the language of the, of the letter, there is a clear need to do additional development in Sacramento. We have three stations in the pipeline in Sacramento, but the region will need more. Um, there is a need for, the, this letter indicates five additional locations in San Diego. Uh, so we definitely need more development in San Diego. Um, we need significant info in Los Angeles and, and uh, and uh, San Francisco, and then um, we need development in the Central Valley, connecting Northern and Southern California, and then the um, and then the Central Coast of California, you know, along you know the Pacific Coast Highway, uh, connecting to uh, the the cities and towns along the coast coastal California. Uh, Dave, I'll add, I'll add San Luis Obispo. We get more comments about that in Las Vegas destination, Correct. and and of course we can't fund California won't fund obviously not in state station, but it will happen. And given what we're seeing going on already in the Las Vegas area, it's no surprise. But San Luis Obispo, that's what we get from a lot of stakeholders. So it yep. is it's been heard. Absolutely, thank you, Keith. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Tim. Um, next question is is a specific question regarding the, um, I believe it was the CARB, Advanced Clean Cars Regulation. Uh, the question is, regarding the chart showing percentage of vehicle sales by 2035, is that projected or is that mandated? Uh, those, I believe th those are the regulatory requirements for new vehicle sales. So we're talking about the chart to the far right. Uh, and then if you Google the Advanced Clean Car 2 regulation, uh, it'll bring you to the, a summary page of the regulation. That's where we pulled this chart from. Um, but it, it indicates um, new vehicle sales, you know, again, starting at 35%, I think that's in 2026, and um, ramping up to 100% by 2035. Thanks, David. Next question is, is around hydrogen um, nozzles and also the difference between H35 and H70. Um, Hopefully, hydrogen filling nozzles will be uniform and not specialized to vehicles similar to the Tesla, for example. And then again, what's the difference between H35 and H70? Do you um, want me to? Yeah, go ahead. Me to, and, go ahead. and I'm just going to really just launch it. The, the partner, the one thing that I think you will find, we learned a lot from our battery electric siblings, from our natural gas siblings. And one of the things the partnership helped resolve was and I'll use a bad Lord of the Rings reference, like I always do, one nozzle to fuel them all. That that there, don't worry, no worries about that. There is there is substantial agreement 
we are not going to, no, on the light, especially in the light duty realm, no, you don't need to worry about that. Dave, I'll let you go on from here. I, I think um, the differences that you see in the H35 versus the H70 nozzles is just, um, it's it's an age difference. Um, H35, uh, it, at the start of the, when the network initiated, H35 was, um, was one of the pressures, the H35, 35 designation refers to the pressure and 70 designation refers to the pressure um, of the hydrogen uh, dispense. Uh, the H35, um, H35 was considered as one of the pressure standards, but if you use that fueling nozzle, it's about half the pressure of an H70 nozzle. So you will only get about a half a few, uh, tank of hydrogen um, because industry standard it for the light duty vehicle market is H70 um, or 70 megapascals. Um, the, uh, what you're seeing on the H35 nozzle side is that those are just the older technology nozzles because H35 is being phased out in the automotive sector. Um, those nozzles have not been upgraded, whereas you see the H70 nozzles all are upgrading to um, a more of a collar uh, snap-on nozzle as opposed to the lever trigger nozzle. Um, and uh, I think that that's all I have to say on that, except that uh, I'm glad that the point is being brought up is um, you may have noticed that on SOS, H35 stations has been removed, um, even though the station still dispenses hydrogen at that H35 pressure. Um, that is because the station developers have prioritized maintenance of their H70 network because that's the predominant network. They felt like um, the H35 status, thought status was a misrepresentation of the availability of hydrogen. And, you know, because of that, you know, preference to, uh, to maintain the H70 network. It's not to say that the H35 nozzles are uh, are not working. It's just that um, they are not sending technicians to service the H35 specifically. Um, if they have a station where there is an H35 mechanical failure, um, it gets serviced when they send the technician out to service the H70 nozzle so that they can just save time and and um, you know use their human resources to, you know, as efficiently as possible. Thanks, David. And I think we, we, we have time for one more question, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. And, and that's around what resources are available for the private sector to open hydrogen stations? And so maybe if you want I to think, um, okay. I'll start. I'll start. And that is, um, well, first and foremost, um, entities who are interested in developing hydrogen stations or station owners they certainly can feel free to reach out to me directly i'll, I'll be happy to point them in the right direction with the resources um, depending on whether you are a actual station on the construction side versus the um versus you know a gas station owner for example that would like to introduce hydrogen as a as a um, fuel at your retail establishment um, it, it, that will change the nature of you know, who I would advise you know you to contact. But um, you know if you're a private, you know if you're a gas station owner, for example, um, I would put you in contact with the developers that are funded by the state. And um, but I think one of the first steps would be to take a look at that uh, priority market location letter that we just discussed. Uh, see if your station overlaps with any of those regions. If you're if a specific, um, you know, region is is uh, not. If your station is not in one of those specific regions or areas, but is in the region in general, I would say I would still encourage you to contact the developers because you know there's not going to be an exact match to every every location. But if you're close, then um, that's probably good enough. Um, if you're a on the construction side, I think that then it would be um, you know a, a completely different conversation regarding you know who to contact in terms of trying to get uh, you know market your services, et cetera. Thanks, David. And so with that, we we are a little bit over time, and so I think, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up here. 
again, uh, there are still a number of questions and we'll try to reach out to you directly. And again, if you have anything uh, that you'd like for us to, to respond to immediately, feel free to contact us um, at, at our emails that was shown earlier. The presentation slides and the, again, the recording will be posted on both our, our website and on YouTube. And so once those uh, materials are posted, we will send out an email to all of the attendees with where that information is, is uh, located. Um, I'll, there's questions about the um, our contact info, so I'm just going to pull it up again one more time. And, and please just, just know that when you email us with questions, sometimes we are, like everybody else in hydrogen, this is accelerated beyond anybody's imaginations, and so bandwidth may be a little bit of an issue, but when we are available, we're going to try and talk your ears off or write your ears off, I guess. Thanks, Keith. Any closing comments, thoughts before we uh, end? David, Keith? Oh, uh, well, just thank you for participating. It's very exciting times, and um, we look forward to you know, growing this market together.